This is a Culture Inject production. The Nevers Podcast presents Firefly Back in the Skies. Hi, I'm Laura, and no, you haven't tuned into the wrong podcast. This is the Nevers podcast, but we're using this downtime between the first and second half of the Nevers season one to revisit one of our all time favourite television shows, Firefly. So, welcome, brown coats, to Firefly Back in the Skies, a culture in just production presented by the Nevers podcast. So, every two weeks, we'll bring you new episodes reviewing every episode of Firefly and maybe, just maybe, a few interviews as well. Now, discussing Firefly amongst ourselves is fun, but what would make it a much better experience and even more enjoyable would be having our listeners join in. So if you have something to contribute, send us a letter or voice recording to fireflybits at gmail.com. That's fireflybits at gmail.com. So uh, what are your memories of watching it for the first time? Um, For me, I actually watched Serenity the movie first. I think coming off of watching, I watched Buffy like when it originally aired and then Angel kind of became difficult to watch because they used to put it on really late at night and I was only kind of like early teens so didn't watch that until I was a bit older and it came out on DVD and I watched kind of like season one to five. So by that time I kind of already passed when Firefly was out on telly and it didn't really air on like regular TV I don't think over in the UK, it was on whatever channel it was on. But in I guess... When I was at college, or possibly the end of school, Serenity the movie came out and my sister worked at Blockbuster. So we would just kind of rent everything that came out. So I watched Serenity and it became one of my all-time favourite sci-fi films. And it wasn't until I think I was in college that I discovered that it was actually from a TV show. And I watched Firefly and I fell in love with it immediately. Yeah, I think I saw the movie first too. Uh, did Did you like it immediately or did it kind of grow on you over time? I really liked the film straight off and kind of, I don't know, I I don't know if it, because obviously, you know, we lose people in the film and then to go back and you watch a TV show show where you fall in love with these characters even more and you get more time to love them knowing what's going to happen in the film. But um, I I really enjoyed it from from the get-go. Did you not? Yeah, I I did too. Uh, I think you're right though in the sense that the film is very um, self, it stands on its own two feet. Like you're mm. you're able to enter into that without having seen the show, and I think I did see the movie before I saw the show too. Um, yeah, and I loved the movie of what I remember of it. Uh, and I was thinking, like, what we're getting to the the question of what is it about this show that resonates so much with so many people, and how has this uh, like tiny little thing that got canceled. 20 years ago survived until today and and why do we love it after so many years and I was thinking um for me personally why it resonates so much and I unearthed quite a bit of material from my unconscious that I wasn't aware of and I wanted to kind of talk about that in broad (laughs) terms there's something about and this is kind of Again, this is in broad terms, and this is about like the central idea of Firefly. There's something about a, a concentration of centralized power and entrenched hierarchy and Kafkaesque bureaucracy that makes me feel weirdly comfortable. And that mm-hmm. as long as I like bow my head and I'm a good little consumer and I honor the social contract that I was made to sign with my little baby fingers... And I promise that I'll grow up to be uh, the the docile automaton they need me to be. I will perform my economic function. I'll be a cog in the corporate machine from eight to six. And then with the rest of my allotted time, I will consume. I will be binge fed all these digital treats and opiates. And I'll watch sitcom simulations of reality that tell me when to laugh. And they make me feel good long enough so that I can wake up again the next morning and continue to service the machine. And as long as I do that, I will be taken care of, and I'll never have to confront the true cost of freedom. And I think the most beautiful thing about Firefly is that it talks about the cost of freedom. 
I, I guess out of gas is the first example that pops in my head. It's like the sacrifice involved with challenging these power structures and traveling outside of the indicated bounds. And it's a struggle for me personally, because I am like, whether I'd like to admit it or not, to some extent, a product of the culture in which I was created. And as a result, I do feel very much domesticated in a society that I can't live without. And I was thinking about that and Serenity, which is the Firefly ship, I think kind of represents a flight from domesticity. Like the ship represents freedom from all these cultural and political forces that are programming us and constantly manipulating and sculpting us into these homogenized shapes, like a weird game of Tetris and like Jeff Bezos is just running up the score exponentially forever while we're just kind of languishing in our learned materialism and consumerism. So we're, we're taught every second, every pop-up ad, every car commercial, that we can somehow purchase fulfillment externally. And until we do, until we get this or get that or watch this or see that, like we're incomplete. Um, I think the character of River really resonates with me and I would point to Malady and the Nevers as another example of this but I think River kind of represents that the promise of this kind of society we're living in and the safety of it is a like a lie it, it's the great lie it's the illusion and innocent people like River will be commodified and used and chewed up and spit out and it happens all the time and it's happening to us right now and we don't even know it even worse we actually want it to happen um and i, I don't want to get too ahead of myself a uh, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen the movie serenity yet but i think that idea of enforced domesticity and all these political and cultural forces that are constantly shaping people and changing them unconsciously to service their base economic agendas i think that idea is at the absolute core of the reaver mystery and um, I'm just going to leave that there for now. Uh, wh like, what was it for you that really resonated f about this show? Or if you have anything to say. I'm going to be like way less deep here and just be like, I mean, it's cowboys in space. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. What's not to love, right? I think it was just something that was new and different. And it's a real shame that it was kind of messed up when it was aired because I think it had the the possibility of being like a long running show that everyone would have really loved. And it's one of those things as well, like would it have done better if it was out now, for instance, on like something like Netflix. But I love all the characters. It's like a band of misfits. They're like all completely different from different places. And they just make this really lovely, weird family. And yeah, I feel like, I think I said this with the Nevers, I like a TV show when I instantly like and kind of bond with every single character. There are a lot of shows out there where there's at least one character that's a bit annoying or you don't really like, whereas in this show, they're all amazing for their own different reasons. You have some that are like a little bit questionable and you want to like delve into what their background is and what their inner thoughts are. It's just a really great mix of people. So I enjoy watching it to just, yeah, delve into these people's lives a bit more yeah that is kind of the strength of it it's the all these different characters and how they re, how they interact with each other and you know their dynamics and so it's, it's a very character focused show uh you mentioned that you cosplayed as firefly characters in the past which characters are their pictures and uh what what was that my first Firefly cosplay was as River, but I cosplayed as River from episode two, where she's in like the mustardy yellow jumper and the cycling shorts. And that was for a three day, basically just Whedon convention called Halloween, which ran over Halloween. I think that was 2010. So this is a while back. <laughs> um, me and my friend went, so yeah, I cosplayed as River and he went kind of a Simon. He's not into cosplay or anything at all we just wore like you know trousers and a shirt so he kind of looked like a respectable doctor he, he should have cosplayed uh, as an actual river that would have been cool 
That would have been cool. But uh, we got a cool photo where I'm kicking him in the throat, you know, so that he doesn't put me to sleep. And then um, my next one was Jane Cobb, which was for an MCM Expo, or now known as Comic-Con in London. Uh, So I had, you know, I'd been bought the yellow t-shirt that he has with the gun on, and I thought, well, you know, I'll throw on some combats and had this, like, army-style jacket. And I made... In the couple days running up to this expo, I made out of basically rubbish uh, <laughs> cardboard boxes and an old bicycle pump and whatever else I could get my hands on, I made uh, Vera, um, his prized possession. And then I've dressed up as him again with a better version of the gun, and I've also made a couple versions of the gun for other people. Um and then I did, I've also cosplayed as River in the Serenity film outfit. So the green dress with the axe and the sword. So that's actually pretty cool. So uh, are you actu- are you are you buying the cosplays pre-made or are you actually making them yourself? So I always try to source clothes from like charity shops, secondhand shops and stuff. Generally, so with like... The river that I did from episode two, I walked into a store and I saw this yellow jumper and I see it and I think, oh, wow, that looks just like River's jumper in in Firefly and I'll buy it. I've got some cycling shorts at home. I usually try to source stuff like that. The same as the green dress. I saw it in a a store, so I bought it for that reason. I usually kind of let kind of let chance lead where my cosplays go. Um, But yeah, and then accessories and like weapons and that I usually make. Um, and that's how I got in, interested in kind of prop making and stuff, which is something I kind of do on the side amongst other things. But um, yeah, they're just kind of like my go-to cosplays now. I've still got like the axe and the sword that I made. I will put up some pictures on my social media for anyone that wants to see. Um, I've also made a Mal Reynolds pistol for someone. That came out really great. I would like to make another one for myself. It's just kind of finding the time. <laughs> wow, we're learning so much about you. Yeah, go check out those pictures. <laughs> Uh, speaking of learning things, uh, we're going to talk about some of the production history and some interesting facts. So, Joss Whedon came up with the idea for Firefly. While vacationing in England and after reading The Killer Angels, a book that depicts the three days of the Battle of Gettysburg during the American Civil War and the days leading up to it. I haven't read that book. Might be an interesting one to pick up. Um, another interesting fact, so uh, Rebecca Gayhart was originally cast as Inara. Uh, the cast originally comprised just five characters, but grew to nine as Joss continued to construct the story and its plots. The scenes where Inara board Serenity and is introduced to the passengers was initially filmed with Gayhart. However, already feeling that she wasn't right for the role due to the lack of chemistry with the other characters, and having decided to replace her, we didn't shot the scene entirely as single shots, only focusing on a single character. So when Marina Baccarin was cast, it was simply a case of filming her lines rather than reshooting the entire sequence. Um, I don't know whether I heard this before or whether this, I just never heard this, but um, it's it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it must be a bummer for uh, whoever it was who lost out on the role, but I feel like now we can say that uh, no one would have done that role other than Marina Baccarin. Like any anything else would have been like a like a poor man's version. I think she just has this perfect balance of, like, power and she's so, not understated, but do you know what I mean? She's really powerful whilst being so polite and held back and she just carries herself so well. Absolutely. Uh, This was one I didn't know, actually. So Neil Patrick Harris read for the part of Simon Tam, uh, even though he wasn't particularly hot on the idea of playing another genius doctor. That's quite funny because he obviously goes on to become Dr. Horrible. Right, Dr. Horrible. But also, (laughs) as some would know him, Doogie Howser. Yes, but he he, uh, ended up going off and becoming Barney Stinson instead, I guess, for a time. (laughs) So the originally aired episodes uh, from Fox all featured an opening monologue. Uh, They were removed for the Blu-ray release, but are still included with the episodes on Amazon Prime and Netflix, which I haven't watched on those i've actually um it's on the disney plus now because it's fox i looked it up on disney plus and i didn't see it there i know disney bought the fox catalog but oh maybe it's just the uk i thought i assumed disney plus and that was kind of like the same in every country but maybe it's not 
So after Fox told uh, Joss that they wanted a lighter episode than Serenity for the pilot, Joss and Tim wrote The Train Job in just two days. Tim Minear, uh, this is a quote from him. We broke the story and each wrote half of the episode. And by Monday morning, we had written the train job episode and the network liked it and we got picked up. Yeah, I heard that story. Uh, The train job is kind of like a backdoor pilot. It introduces all the characters and sets up a lot of their dynamics independently of the Mm. first one. But it does feel a bit redundant when you watch it in order. Some, some of the aspects. But I think they did a good job with that one, too. Yeah, it's a great episode. Uh, and then Fox only aired 11 of the 14 episodes and aired those episodes out of order. Serenity was the original two-hour pilot episode for the series, but the executives at Fox wanted a pilot episode that contained more action, So, which ended up being the first episode aired. It's unfortunate because the actual intended order provided an introduction to the character's That was smooth, made more sense chronologically, and provided more background to the story. So while Joss wrote Serenity to be episode one, it ended up airing on December 20th, 2002 as episode 11. That's crazy. Yeah, see, I can't imagine watching everything like in the order that it was aired and getting to the end and they air this and you're like, why are we, why, why? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? You'd be like, why are we going back to the beginning, essentially? Uh, It... Yeah, it's a shame because the Serenity Part 1 and 2 as, you know, the pilot, I found it really, I think it's a great pilot. Sabotage. It's sabotage, I say. So the proper chronological episode order as told by Joss is Serenity Part 1 and 2, which as Chirag just mentioned, didn't air until the 20th of December in 2002. Then you had The Train Job, so that aired first on the 20th of September, then Bushwhacked. That aired on, aired on the 27th of September. Then we had Shindig, which was on the 1st of November. Safe, which is the 8th of November. Our Mrs. Reynolds, 4th of October. Janestown, 18th of October. Out of Gas, 25th of October. Then Ariel, but that didn't air until 15th of November. War Stories, which was the 6th of December. And then, sadly, Trash never aired. The Message, which never aired. And Heart of Gold, which never aired. But Objects in Space was aired on the 13th of December. So, yeah, there's ones that are just in the wrong order. And then these last few that never aired. If you purchase Firefly on Blu-ray, the episodes are organised in the order that Joss meant for them to be aired. Fans of the show attempted to save the series from being cancelled by raising money for a Variety magazine ad. They also started a postcard writing campaign to Fox and tried to get UPN to pick up the series. So the Alliance's full title is the Anglo-Sino Alliance. Uh, Joss Whedon initially intended, or not initially, he intended it for it to be the merger of the USA and China. Uh, The last of the world superpowers. Mm, That's why many of the characters sometimes speak Chinese. I do think it's a bit of a the maybe the biggest blind spot of the show that there's no major characters of uh, East Asian descent. Maybe in the reboot. Yeah, no, that's maybe in the reboot that's coming up. (laughs) So, uh, Chirag, have you read any of the novelizations or listened to the audio? I have not. I haven't listened to any audio books, but I have. I think read all of the novelizations. I had a quick look on my uh, kind of comic book shelf. I've got Shepherd's Tale, Better Days, and Those Left Behind. I don't know if I've got any more hiding, but I've definitely read those ones for sure. Yeah, I read and, Shepherd's uh, Tale. They, yeah, I read that one. I think they're very strong, um, like graphic novels. I enjoyed them. Um, but there is the Firefly audiobooks by James Lovegrove, and they come highly recommended by our producer Matthew, who's listened to all of them and has nothing but high praise for the series. The stories are well written and exciting and characters are well captured and the voice acting is excellent. James Anderson Foster does a spot on Mal Reynolds impression. And then obviously there's a movie, a most excellent movie called Serenity and we'll review that once we're done with the television series. Um, Just another last little piece of information for us. Uh, Firefly won the Emmy for Outstanding Visual Effects for a series. And I think um, going back and rewatching, I've I've just watched, I'm going to watch the episodes as we review them. But for an early 2000s TV show, the budget for the effects, I think, is pretty good. And they, I don't know, they do a pretty good job. Like it still looks not particularly awful now. 
when you think about it. But it still looks like it looks pretty uh, dated on rewatch at this point, which is not a bad thing because now it feels like it has a kind of visual personality to it. But yeah, it's like a nostalgia, and a, it's like you know when you go back and watch like Matrix, even like the Matrix Three is like really rounded video game graphics. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like this kind of stuff, especially when you're watching a sci-fi thing with like spaceships and things, I think it ages in a way that yeah makes it kind of nostalgic and fun to watch, as opposed to being like, oh man, can't watch this, it's awful. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not like the special <laughs> effects blend like are are unnoticeable or or they're pretty they're pretty oh, no. noticeably like not modern. We'll say that. But I still love it. Yeah. Like upon watching um Buffy again and Angel, it's funny like every time a vampire is going to change from like their human look to their vampire look, like the whole frame goes blurry. So like you know it's going to happen because they blur basically the whole frame and then blur the bit where it crosses over from then changing it's kind of yeah like stuff like that it's really noticeable and you think nowadays with the technology you have it would just be like you wouldn't even know they've done something yeah so today we're talking about like you mentioned the the two hour first episode uh aired on december 20th 2002 a little synopsis mal reynolds is a veteran and captain of serenity he and his crew are smuggling goods but they need to pick up some passengers for extra money however not all the passengers are what they seem so we have a fantastic cast and crew Uh, we have nathan fillion who plays malcolm reynolds gina therese who plays zoe washburn anna tudyk who plays hoban washburn or most known as wash uh, Marina Baccarin, who plays Anara Serra. Adam Baldwin is Jane Cobb. Jewel State is Kaylee Fry. Sean Mayer is Dr. Simon Tam. Summer Glau is River Tam. We have Ron Glass as Shepard Book. Carlos Jacot as Lawrence Dobson. And last but not least, we have Mark Shepard as Badger. This was edited by The Nevers' uh, Lisa Lasek and written and directed by Joss Whedon. Any initial impressions? I think I said this earlier, I really like it. Like, for a for a first episode of a show, I think it does a really good job of, yeah, introducing us to all the characters. We're not, I think similarly to what I said about the Nevers, we're not kind of spoon-fed everything. It's kind of like, here we are, and from what's going on and what's happening, we can tell, you know, we've got the Alliance and we've got the brown coats, and you kind of see what the world is like now, you know, how these guys survive straight up you kind of think they're not bad people but they sometimes have to do relatively bad things because it's just the way of the world that they live in but yeah I think it's a strong like I haven't watched it for a good few years but when when I first discovered the show I watched it a lot so I was watching it again and really enjoying it even though I knew I was trying to kind of like be fresh into it but I couldn't help but remember like all the dialogue and exactly what was going to happen. But I, I I really enjoyed it again after not watching it for a few years. Yeah, I I mean I watch it a lot every now and again. I guess I I just sometimes just throw it on uh, when I'm bored. Um, I, I I guess it's not an initial impression because these impressions have kind of formed over time and are at this point like calcified and hard stone. It's not like I can change my mind right now, but I I do love this episode and I, I love how everything is so hard, you know, like every there's, it's such a struggle, everything, um, the parts are falling out. There's not enough money. There's not enough gas. Um, the, Mm. the cargo isn't good. The business isn't good. Everything is always a struggle. And I think that kind of is a, uh, like like I mentioned earlier, is such a price to pay for not assimilating uh, into the, I guess, roles that are considered legal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really liked, the, the, I guess that's an initial impression. Yeah, like you said, like, this is their, this, you know, the serenity is their little bit of freedom, but that comes at this high price of kind of living on the edge the entire time. So, um, Chirag, we know you like analysing the names of characters. Uh, did you come up with anything for Firefly's characters? I mean, Shepard's book is rather on the nose, but what did you think Joss was trying to say with River's name? And what about Jane? So, with Jane, I think 
I do think that it's suspiciously close to Judas in that they both start with J and they have five letters. Um, mm. And also that Jane is constantly betraying everyone. <laughs> the, I guess there's also the femininity of the name Jane feels like an attempt at subverting the masculinity of that character archetype. And then obviously yeah. Mal means bad and it's a very, it's like a very scoundrel, morally dubious name. Um, I could be wrong, but I think Mal was somewhat inspired by Han in Star Wars. Like Mal and Han are both these one syllable, very economic, forcefully expressive names kind of go together. Uh, River, I guess, as a name feels very naturalistic, free flowing, life giving. And as a metaphor, like river getting commodified and corrupted by the government is kind of akin to pollution, but I might be reaching there. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think so. Like, I think for the Nevers, the names being significant was really baked into the story. The names, like there, the names are sacred and there's a lot of meat not on that bone. But here, I don't think there's much you can do with Kaylee other than to say it's a cute name for a cute character. But I, there, I, in the, all these Whedon shows, all the characters do tend to have interesting names. Um, regardless, there's, there's never like a, like a Tom or, or, or a Bill. They're, they're always pretty interesting names. Yeah. We'll start discussing some of the themes. I think we heavily spoke about themes in, uh, the Nevers. And I don't think I've ever kind of thought about themes when I've watched this show. I feel like I've never really like heavily delved into this show. I've talked about it a lot with friends, but it's more just like super nerding out and just talking about how much we love it as opposed to like delving into it and what we might think the show deeply means. Um, so our first theme is deception. So like, yeah, in this episode, especially, you know, you have Dobson. Well, it's just kind of like a whole mix of things straight away. Like you're faced with all these characters that you're just meeting for the first time and that the crew's meeting for the first time. They're trying to hide something and it's like, you know, what's going to happen? Surely one of these people's going to betray them at one point. So you've got Dobson. He ends up deceiving the crew, obviously. Uh, Simon, who's deceiving the crew. You've got uh, Patience at the end when they do the deal, who's deceiving Mal. And you've got the the Reavers who deceive the entire crew by making them think that they're not being pursued and then they end up pursuing them. Yeah, the whole like mystery part of it, uh, when all the guests are coming aboard, that felt a bit like mm. Agatha Christie to me. It felt like Minnie's haberdashery and you don't really know um, who who is who yet. I like that. Yeah, I think I had, I, I guess watching the film first, and then watching the show, obviously you know who the people are. Right. But I can I can see how watching it first, you would have been like, Simon looks kind of suspect and a bit kind of like, like he's being very stern and holding back. And the other guy is just like a bit of a fumbling mess. So you can see why why you would be deceived by it. Shit, yeah, I mean, like, um, he's dressed in contrast to his environment, like like, like yeah. the devil. Like, he's wearing a jacket and sunglasses. <laughs> With the glasses, And the music yeah. changes to telegraph that this guy is not supposed to be here. It's very, like, um, like the misdirect is very hard. It's almost too obvious, and, and maybe that's the point of it. The next theme uh, is loyalty. So we've got Simon's loyalty to his sister. Um, and obviously he's gone through a great, great uh, deal of work to get his sister back with him. Uh, we've got Zoe's loyalty to Mal, which is always interesting because obviously she's married to Wash. And it's like, I feel like she cares about them equally but obviously one's kind of like her best friend and her captain and he, she's got all this loyalty to him and the other one's her husband but she like loves them equally and they're just yeah I just love the dynamics of the relationships in this show and then we have Mal's loyalty to his crew and he says some really interesting stuff in this it's kind of like um I don't know just the whole time again it's the it's the to keep your little world safe and to keep what he has and his family, he has to do some not very good things, but you know that he's a stand-up guy and he will always look out for his crew. Yeah, and then 
with uh with Zoe's loyalty to Mal, uh, like her fractured loyalty between Mal and Wash, and we'll probably talk about this uh when War Stories comes around because that's really the central yes. theme of that one. But it's really cool how like um all the evidence that we see on the screen is of her uh listening to Mal's orders as they are mm-hmm. spoken uh and saying sir and and you know being obedient like you would in war but we learn later on that her ultimate act of rebellion uh was i guess not rebellion but her her choosing to be with wash was in um uh protest to mal saying you can't be with him or something like that i don't know we'll get to that later uh, so then we have a mass amount of sexual tension going on. So um, in terms of like all the sexual roles, we've got like your traditional, so Mal and Anara's relationship, you know, straight from the get go, um, he's kind of coming across as this protective dominant man and she's this soft-spoken woman uh, feigning like with a feigning lack of interest. Um, but, I don't know. I guess they're the couple in the show that are the like, will they, won't they kind of thing. That's what they're providing. They're, yeah. We've got like Zoe and Wash, who are this perfect married couple. Um, they're like couple goals. And then you've got Mao and Anara, and that's the will they, won't they aspect of the show. So, like I just said, the non traditional relationship Zoe and uh, Walsh is because she's like the dominant one the fighter, the soldier, and then Wash is kind of like nerdy and bashful. They're quite an interesting couple in that respect, but I love them. They're amazing. And then you've got Anara. So, you know, her status as a respectable companion. uh, So companions seem to have more in common with like geisha or courtesans rather than like a hooker or just a whore. So um, this places her in a non-traditional female role. Her control over her sexuality puts her in a sexually powerful and dominant position. And yeah, I think it's really interesting to see that because in this world, being a companion is kind of a respectable, it's a respectable job and it's quite a powerful high up position where she has a lot of control over her clientele and what she does. Uh, We'll talk more about that a lot, I'm sure. I I have quite a a bit to say about that. Yeah, so survival. Um, Mal and Zoe, obviously at the beginning, they're surviving the Battle of Serenity Valley. Then we have the Serenity crew. Um, they've survived their run-in with the Reavers, and that's twice in that episode alone. Um, we've got the Reavers surviving her torture at the hands of Parliament, the Alliance, um, who are the ruling body. And uh, Mal, who survived his run-in with Patience. And obviously he talks about he's already been shot once with Patience, and then they obviously go and have this other encounter where they survive. And I think that's a big thing about the show. It, it is just this band of misfits that don't necessarily always know what they're doing or you know are not particularly experts in their field for example but they're they're out there and they're living their life and they're surviving and that's the best you can do sometimes is to just survive yeah it's surviving barely is a is a constant in the show like they barely make it to the edge of dying i think everybody gets shot or or like punched or maimed or something yeah, we'll jump into the plot. We might not delve into everything like super, super deep, but we'll 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 graze through the. I wanted to do for the for the opening scene. I wanted to do like a like a quick scene breakdown of the beginning sequence because it really is like Mal's origin story, and it's the most yes. important piece of character knowledge that we have of him. And I think it's about the shattering of his belief in a higher purpose and a higher power. I'll explain why yeah. I think that. So, so like the independents are getting bombed, and the soldiers are scared and overwhelmed, and morale is low. And uh, this here here was Mal's dialogue in this situation. He says, "The Alliance said they were going to waltz through Serenity Valley, and we've choked them with those words. We've done the impossible, and that makes us mighty. We've done the impossible, and that makes us mighty." So, like, here we're starting in a place where Mal has this extraordinary strength and is able to inspire and galvanize the troops, right? So, he continues in that same scene, uh, telling the other soldiers, Just a little while longer, our angels are going to be soaring over, raining fire on those arrogant Kangs. 
Uh, so, like, the key thing in this bit of dialogue is that Mal uses the word angels to reference the air support that he believes will come to rescue them. And then in the next scene, Zoe asks, do you really think we can bring her down, sir, referencing the enemy ship? And Mal has a, this very confident, strong response. He says, uh, you even need to ask. Uh, do you even need to ask? And then he kisses that cross around his neck. And what that scene does is it draws a direct line in between Mal's confidence and strength and his faith in God. Because Mal knows he can bring that enemy ship down because he has faith in God and he believes in his higher purpose. And it's that belief which gives him the strength to accomplish the impossible. And it's that belief which makes him mighty. And like we do see like very heroically he takes down the enemy ship. And then in the next scene, we see a soldier named Bendis who's scared of dying. And this was Mal's dialogue in this situation. He says, we can't die, Bendis. You know why? Because we are so very pretty. We are just too pretty mm -hmm. for God to let us die. And then when Zoe reveals that the air support isn't coming, that, I think, represents the absence of God because in that moment, Mal is not just abandoned by the air support, he's abandoned by his faith in God, his faith in the angels that were promised to come, and his belief in a higher purpose. And then we see him like standing there in shock while those glum violins are playing, and the Alliance ships are rising above Serenity Valley in victory. And then going back to that Bendis scene, we see Bendis gets killed in the background like pretty nonchalantly, and if you'll remember, like Mal said that God wouldn't let Bendis die. Mal was wrong. He lost. And in being wrong, he lost not just the war. He lost his faith in God. And that's, I think, precisely why Shepard Book needed to be on Serenity. And we'll we'll talk about that scene later on with Shepard Book when he asks, why am I here? But. I think Book needed to be on the ship to represent what Mal lost, but what doesn't need to be lost forever. And I think all of the characters represent to Mal things that he's lost, like voids in his soul. So through the Mal prism, I think Kaylee represents innocence and goodness. I think Inara represents love. I think Simon represents the society that Mal left behind. I think River represents why he left that society behind. And uh, like last of all, I think Jane represents not what Mal has lost, but what he could very easily become. So I think that's kind of maybe the, the gathering together of all these characters is all of these um, externally manifested things that... He's keep he wants on the ship with him because they're not inside him anymore. I think that's the affinity for Kaylee that because she's so pure and she's so innocent and she's so good, and um, I don't know, that's that's my idea and that that's kind of like the breakdown of that opening scene and what that means. Did you have any thoughts on that scene? I mean, the big thing that I was going to pick out was the the kissing of the cross and then how that obviously. Um, like juxtaposes how his attitude is towards God throughout this ep episode with Shepherd Book. So, yeah, it's like straight away we're given this, we're shown the huge pivotal moment of this character's life. Like I said, it is basically his backstory would be given right at the beginning. Right, to, to quote, I guess, to quote Nirvana, uh, losing my religion. It's kind of that moment. So after this pretty epic opening it cuts to six years later so Mal's now a captain of his own transport ship uh, which is the Firefly class named Serenity Zoe is his second command and we see Mal, Zoe and Jane are attempting to melt open a hatch of an abandoned wreck Wash is on Serenity keeping watch and he detects a Tohoku uh, class cruiser approaching them he contacts Mal who tells him to cut the power on Serenity to escape detection so we're seeing like straight away the kind of stuff they get up to and how close they come to getting caught all the time 
Wash tells Kaylee, who is the ship's engineer, to cut everything down, uh, shut everything down, but the cruiser detects some residual heat from Serenity and they actively begin scanning. The Serenity crew has to speed up loading everything onto the ship, um, and but the cruiser sends gunships to stop them. Mal orders Wash to engage the crybaby. Uh, that's a decoy distress beacon whose transmission is mistaken, uh, mistaken by the Dortmunder to be another tr- uh, ship in trouble. So, you know, they send, they go to help that ship instead of following Serenity, but they put out an alert uh, or a bulletin that there's a Firefly class ship carrying stolen Alliance goods, which is never going to be good. So yeah, straight away we're introduced to like the kind of life they're living now, the fact that they're having to basically, you know, they're like, scavengers or whatever in space and now they've got the alliance um kind of out looking for a firefly class ship right and then so it's not a good space (laughs) no no not a good space and then when mal inspects the cargo uh he (laughs) realizes that the alliance stamped every molecule of it or something Mm -hmm. like that which means it's traceable and it can't be sold on the black market so that sucks too I wanted to uh, jump to, or maybe not jump, but when they're first like getting the cargo into the ship, Jane says, uh, and like they escaped from the Alliance and they got the goods and all that stuff. Jane says, as long as we got the goods, I'll call this a win. Uh, and then Mal says, right. And the camera cuts to his face, which is wearing this like world weary, forlorn, forlorn expression. Mm-hmm. And he says, "We win." Uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm not performing that dialogue like he does. But <laughs> he says, "We win," uh, and I think that's an emotional reference to Mal just losing so much to the Alliance, like losing yeah. again and again. And that relationship between Mal and the Alliance is defined by loss. Like he lost the battle. He lost his faith. He lost his honor. He lost so much of his of himself and. All of that was contained within that scene of Mal saying, right, we win. So it's just little moments like that, which I love, little character moments. Mal announces they'll be taking some passengers because they're hard on for money. We see Inara, a companion, finishing up her session with a young Alliance officer before contacting Serenity and being instructed to meet at the East Town docks. I did want to mention one thing here. So there's like a little, uh, there's like a little post-coital conversation between Inara and the officer where she's talking about how beautiful the place is where she studied being a companion from. Um, Like she describes it as an ocean of light and the young Alliance officer is like, wow, I can't imagine ever leaving. And then there's a quick edit where we see Inara's face turn dark and morose Mm -hmm. before cutting quickly back to her smiling again and saying, well, I wanted to see the universe. And I think that's a hint at something that we might talk about later, which is the reason Inara left her paradise to live on a dingy old little smuggler ship is because she's terminally ill and dying and doesn't want to become emotionally attached to anyone or anything. We can Mm -hmm. probably talk about that later, but I think it's ironic that her reasoning for wanting to be on a ship like Firefly, uh, like she she does become emotionally attached to the ship and the people. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think that scene's filmed really interesting because that end conversation, she's speaking... But it cuts to the shot of her, like, looking away, like said, and looking kind of, like, sad or whatever. But she's talking at the same time. It's really interestingly done. So then we see Serenity land on Persephone and the crew members split up. So Kaylee stays around to find passengers. Wash takes Serenity's utility vehicle to go get supplies, which they desperately need. <laughs> um, and Mal, Zoe and Jane go to speak with Badger. Uh, I love, I love Badger. I think I forgot how much I loved Badger. <laughs> on a rewatch he's I've met Mark Shepard uh, at a convention and he's yeah on the top of the like amazing people I've met um he was fantastic and yeah so going back and seeing this again he's he's just fantastic so yeah Isn't they have, he in like every single genre show that's ever existed he's like um so after he did Firefly he 
Well, he was in Doctor Who a few years ago, and then he was in um, was he he was became quite a main character in Supernatural after that. But um, he's he's yeah he's been in everything now. I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he was in Lucifer too, and then he's gonna be in um, uh, Neil Gaiman's Netflix adaptation of The Sandman. Uh, yeah, he's he's like a conquering every science fiction property that exists on tv <laughs> but yeah i think he was he's like, a good actor yeah. he's a great actor he is um badger does say something in the scene which does a good job of summarizing mal uh so so badger says that mal thinks of himself as a man of honor in a den of thieves and i think mm. that is an internal conflict within mal because in order to survive like you said he has to act dishonorably from time to time. Like yeah. when Zoe asks him if there's something wrong with the cargo, Mal says no, and he's still willing to sell it to Badger while knowing full well every molecule is government stamped. So he's kind of like fucking over Badger, but he needs the money. So it's 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 an interesting conflict that living so far off the grid requires you to make decisions and choices that challenge your personal morality or mm. um i guess your honorability and badger is like he says he's you know the opposite of mal mal's living this life but still trying to believe that he's some kind of you know sergeant or he's he's higher up than everybody else whereas badger you know he knows where he's at and uh yeah he's just such a character. I love his little um, apple peeling contraption on the desk. Oh, I didn't it's notice just, that. Yeah, he's got one of those little things like you turn, you put your apple on it and you turn it and it like peels a tiny little strip of the apple at a time and like peels it all off in one go. It's just great because he's just, you know, running this whole operation, sitting at his desk, peeling apples all day. <laughs> so yeah, after that, because of the, the stuff being marked... The crew's forced to leave empty-handed because Badger refuses to take it all. Yeah, and then uh, they pick up their first person. Yeah, uh, we we are introduced to Shepard Book, who meets Kaylee, and um, they kind of bond over the ship, Serenity. He notices that... Uh, Kaylee notices that he's looking at the ships and not their destinations, and um, the Shepard tells her that he's a Shepard from South Down Abbey, He's got a little bit of money, but he also has something in a small box, which he shows to her, which seems to impress her. So, uh, how come you don't care where you're going? Because how you get there is the worthier part. Are you a missionary? I guess. I'm a shepherd from the South Down Abbey. Book. I'm called Book. Been out of the world for a spell. I'd like to walk it a while. Maybe bring the word that them is needed told. Well, I'm Kaylee. And this here's Serenity. And she's the smoothest ride from here to Boros for anyone can pay. Can you pay or? Well, I got a little cash and uh Ooh. Grandpa. I never married. When I went to the Halloween event, Jewel State was there and someone asked, you know, do you really love strawberries? And she said that she hates them. She does not like the taste of strawberries. So she said it was quite interesting for her to have to take this huge bite of a strawberry and really look like, you know, she loved every second of it. But yeah, she's not a fan of strawberries. So interesting little thing there. So we then see Mao and company uh, discuss how to unload their cargo while returning to Serenity. Despite being shot by her in the past, Mao decides to sell it to patients despite Zoe's objections. So as the crew all arrive back at Serenity, the new passengers come on board, including a man named Dobson and a wealthy doctor named Simon. Zoe doesn't like the thought of having passengers sitting right on top of their stolen cargo, but Mao laughs it off. Um, then we see Inara arrive in a shuttle and the crew and passengers prepare to take off. And we see 
with Inara, kind of our first sign that Mal doesn't care for her job as a companion. Um, in the cargo bay, Inara exits her shuttle and Mal introduces her to Book, referring to her somewhat half-seriously as an ambassador. Book takes this literally, but Mal explains that she's a whore uh, and Kelly corrects, corrects him to say companion. So it's kind of like, at this point, you know, does Mal really not care for her profession as a companion? Or is it because he has romantic interests in her and, you know, having to see her go out and be with all these other people is painful and, you know, this is kind of how he just covers for it. Um, like I said, I think they're the will-they-won't-they they couple. I think they do really care about each other and they do mostly just show that with sarcastic quips. I think some of the funniest interactions are actually between the two of them through the show. Yeah, I think he but it does really deep down hate the fact, yeah, that she's a companion. Yeah, I mean they definitely care about each other. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save, I'm gonna save my insight on that for later. I, I have something to say about that. Um, for the for the next scene, so we see all the passengers and the crew. They're sitting around the dinner table. Book asks if he can say grace, and then Mal replies only if you say it out loud. Which is again like a like a like a full circle thing where we see that you know um, the residue of war and of that moment that we saw in the beginning that he he doesn't believe in God anymore. He was abandoned by God in in that moment, and he may have some kind of antagonism towards the men of God at this point. And then um, Simon asks if the Alliance often commandeers the Serenity and, and the passengers and crew kind of proceed to talk about the political climate and the, the difficulties of, of all the border worlds. And I, I love how everybody's answer to Simon's question, which was about the Alliance, really sums up their relationship with the government. Like Mal responds, that's what governments are for, get in a man's way. Because, of course, Mal is anti-government. And then the government mole guy responds, well, it's good if the supplies are needed. And him, like that guy being pro-government is the first hint that he's the mole. Yeah. And then Jane responds, we're just happy to be doing good works. <laughs> and if you know anything about Jane, you know he doesn't care about doing good works. Um, because Jane's only allegiance so, so far is to himself. And that really, like, that response shows that he's neutral in regards to the government. He'll work for the government. He'll work against the government. He doesn't really care. He's got no horse in the race. Kaylee seems to be taken by Simon, which amuses Jane. And then Jane makes a couple of rude comments. Uh, and then Mal orders him to leave, which is another instance of, like, a man of honor. Yeah, it's that, you know, even though, like I say, they do questionable things all the time, he's still kind of like the stand-up guy and he has these core beliefs. So, you know, you, you don't talk like that at the table and you especially don't talk like that to a woman, which is funny because of the stuff that he comes out with about Nara. But I love the part of this where he's like, what's his job, you know, on the ship? And he's like, oh, Jane, uh, public relations. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way they say stuff. It's so, like especially Nathan Fillion, like it just comes out so deadpan serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> and that would be the like the worst job you could possibly choose as an example, public relations. <laughs> Jane would be the worst at public relations. <laughs> uh, so then we see Inara in her shuttle giving herself a sponge bath uh, uh, when Be uh, Shepherd Book arrives with dinner. Um, they discuss Malcolm Reynolds uh, meanwhile, Wash summons Mal to the bridge, where Wash informs him that someone on board sent a message to a Tohoku class cruiser that there's a mole on the ship. Can we just um, contrast real quick the Inara hygiene scene with Mal's hygiene scene? Because <laughs> like Inara looks like a like a glimmering goddess in that scene, and there's beautiful music playing. She's cleaning herself almost ceremonially like a spiritual practice and then cut to Mal just wiping his wet dick hands on his face <laughs> and grabbing a towel 
um, I thought that transition to Mal's hygiene was hilarious, especially when in like the scene immediately previous they were talking about him, like he's so interesting and mysterious. Mm. Then we just kind of cut to this <laughs> little intimate scene where he's he's being uh, very unhygienic. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I, I find the uh, inner workings of the ship interesting. So their bunks are quite small and they've got this little pull-out toilet and he just kicks it back. But it is crazy. You know, he pulls out the drawer with his uh, sink. It's all very smartly designed. But yeah, he like washes his hands. They obviously don't have soap. And then he just put those clearly not clean hands straight up on his face. And I, I was looking and thinking the same thing. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I do really like the design of the of the ships and the bunks. Although I did think to myself on rewatching this, the the kind of room where they end up holding the the Alliance guy and where River and Simon are staying are like big kind of um, nice looking rooms. And then all of the crew are staying in these like tiny little metal bunks. And you just think, what, like, when they've not got people on board, what are they using those rooms for? Like, they're just sitting there, these big, nice, fancy rooms, doing nothing. I just, it just uh, occurred to me when I was watching it. Um, so yeah, this is funny as well. This moment's great. So as soon as they find out that someone sent a beacon, Mal's like, it's sufficiently, it's Simon, and he goes straight to him and um, punches him straight away, confronts him at gunpoint. Uh, Book appears and points out to Mal that Dobson is on a catwalk pointing a gun at Mal. <laughs> so it's like, you know, he he jumps the gun and he punches Simon. Um, also, I have to point out, as a lover of weapons and props, that when Mal pulls his gun out for the first time, my first, my first thought is like, damn, that's pretty. Like, that's one of the best film TV guns ever. It's such can we a also gun. point out? Can we also point out how there's like four plot twists in a row? Like first Mal thinks it's Simon, and then Book comes out of the shadows like he's the mole, right. and then the Dobson guy is revealed on the catwalk at he's the mole, and then it's revealed the Dobson guy's after Simon, not Mal. Oh, that moment is so good. <laughs> um, he's got his hands up in the air, and then he's like, says it's Simon, and he's just like, oh, great. But yeah, before that, Mal's like, wow, this is not my best day ever. Another, like, <laughs> really straight up thing for him to say. And yeah, like I said, the hands up moment is absolutely brilliant. So then uh, the the mole government, the Fed, informs Simon that he's bound by law and wanted by the Alliance for something. What? We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Mal urges Simon to stand down. Book tries to de-escalate and calm everyone down. Kaylee and Jane suddenly enter, and then the nervous Dobson fed guy reacts by shooting Kaylee. So that kind of felt like that that was inspired by um that felt like it was inspired by scenes of some of the police brutality we see in America, like an authority figure with a gun mm -hmm. who is needlessly escalating a situation. And then impulsively shoots an innocent party. Yeah, because you've got the people there like, you know, we can discuss this. We're all, yeah. you know, we're all here. We can discuss this. First of all, like, you know, you're waving a gun around on a ship. There's all these innocent bystanders. You clearly look shaky and nervous. And yeah, then the next moment happens with Kaylee. And I've just written in my notes, not Kaylee. <laughs> Because even though you just met this character, like you say, she represents, she's she's so bright and shiny and her smile just lights up a room. She's this innocent, lovely character that would never hurt a fly and this idiot's just shot her. So yeah, I'm like, yeah. It really makes him the villain in a really efficient way. Yeah. Um, and also I need to point out, I think at that point, Jane pulls out his gun, his handgun, and I'm like, damn, another really pretty gun. So moving on, Mal intends to hand Simon over to Tohoku class cruiser, but Simon threatens not to treat Kaylee if he does and tells Mal to flee. After a tense moment, Mal reluctantly agrees. Simon works on Kaylee in the infirmary, uh, removing the bullet fragments. Um, curious about what 
uh, why the Alliance wanted Simon, Mal goes and opens Simon's crate and finds a young girl inside. Mal assumes that she's a slave, but Simon explains that the girl is River Tam's sister. So, sorry, River Tam, who is his sister. Yeah, I like how the the infirmary scene I like because, like, all this stuff is happening and they go in and then it all becomes very kind of, like, a real kind of hospital drama. And he's just like, do you have one of these? And Mal's like, no. And then, you know... I think it's whoever comes in, was it Zoe comes in and he's like, go get my bag. No, Jane, go get my bag. I need whatever. And it's just like all efforts are now going into saving Kaylee. And you see everyone kind of working apart and working together to now make sure that Kaylee doesn't die. She's very fond to, uh, everybody's very fond of her. Yeah. And we see later on, um, Jane is outside the window, like really really a little bit of a mess like worried about her that she's gonna die and he yeah was, i liked that yeah i liked that. yeah it's a really nice moment because obviously the last time we see them he's like comically harassing her about simon and it's kind of like i don't know they're more like a brother and sister and you know you take the mick out of each other all the time but you obviously care about each other a lot so it's nice to see that side of Jane. Yeah, this moment with the uh, crate that's holding River is brilliant. So Mao opens it and when he sees, he just simply goes, huh? <laughs> Gives a little like hurt sound and I just, yeah, I can't help but crack up laughing at that. His face is yeah. priceless. Yeah, it's it's well delivered and it's a good uh, uh, segue to a commercial break. Yeah, that perfect moment. <laughs> um yeah, and then the better reaction even after that is when he's turned around and he's like, obviously, what is this? Like, then she wakes up, make like making a little bit of a, a sound and he just literally gives us this like comical little scream and like jumps well away from the crate. That moment is so hilarious. Later we see that whole speech where Simon is like standing in front of everybody and explaining how smart he is and how smart River is in comparison to him, which makes her even smarter. I am very smart. I went to the best medicat in Osiris, top 3% of my class. I finished my internship in eight months. Gifted is the term. So when I tell you that my little sister makes me look like an idiot child, I want you to understand my full meaning. River was more than gifted. She, she was a gift. Everything she did, you know, music, math, theoretical physics, even, even dance, there was nothing that didn't come as naturally to her as breathing does to us. How he rescued her and they're on the run and the government is after them. Um, I wanted to jump a little bit ahead to the second time that Mal punches Simon. We can talk more about that scene if you want, but uh, I noticed that the first time Mal punches Simon, it's because he thought he was a mole. And then he kind of does this little silly like thing where he shakes his hand in the air like the punch hurt. And then... The second time Mal punches Simon, there's no silliness or shaking hands at all because Simon like really crossed the line when he was talking to Mal, like um, saying, oh, you should you should be working for them, you should be working for Alliance. And what? why are you so scared of them? And just like prying that Pandora's box open without any regard as to what's inside. And the second punch in contrast to the first punch, I thought was a good little arc for Mal, I guess. Okay, uh, so so Mal decides to proceed with those stolen goods, the cargo, uh, take it to a border planet and sell it to patients who had shot him in the past for reasons unknown. Um, meanwhile, Jane interrogates the Fed guy to find out how much he told the Alliance about them. Uh, the Fed guy offers a bribe to Jane, but it's kind of, it cuts from there and we don't know if Jane accepted the bribe or not. That's yeah. kind of left up to our imagination. So I love this part. He's like, you know, you've only got to scare, he takes Jane aside. He's like, look, you've only got to scare him. 
And Jane's like, pain is scary. <laughs> He's not wrong. Yeah. He's not wrong. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, obviously during the interrogation, He's like, oh, he doesn't know anything, like, straight away. And he's, like, really upset that he hasn't been able to talk to the guy. <laughs> Jane's a little bit brutal, but we love him anyway. So, yeah, like I say, we're left on the little cliffhanger of, like, is he going to betray Ma- like betray Mal? We don't know. We'll see. So we see uh, Wash and Mal observe an old trans you approaching, uh, and they realise it's a Reaver raiding party. So he explains Reavers to Simon, who's only heard about them in, like, you know, ghost stories or whatever. Because he's super privileged and he's, you know, lives in the safe zone. Um, she tells him that if they board the ship, everyone on Serenity will be raped to death, cannibalised, and have their skin sewn into the insides of the Reaver's clothing. And if they're very lucky, they'll do it in that order. Uh, fortunately, the Reaver ship passes by. So this is, like, very quickly in this moment you see how tense and scared everybody is. You see, um, with Zoe's explanation, you you learn very quickly that these Reavers are extraordinarily bad news. Yeah, it's a good world building technique where you you like teach the audience to be afraid of an enemy by showing everybody else being afraid. They use the same technique in the Nevers with everyone in the orphanage being afraid of the Beggar King. Um, and uh, Simon is kind of like our portal into this world. Like when Zoe is telling that to Simon, she's telling it to us because we've never been in space that far either. We've never been in this universe. And so we're we're kind of hearing about this for the first time. And it's, it's a really effective technique. Yeah. Uh, we then see Inara uh, in her shuttle. She's giving... Simon, some of the immunization packs. Uh, Simon apologizes for his part in the current situation, and Anara explains that he fits in with the rest of the, of the crew. Um, Mal arrives, and when Anara tells him that he's on her shuttle, Mal points out that she is merely renting the shuttle from him. So we've got this whole like power play going on. You know, it's his ship, but it's her shuttle. She's renting it from him, but he needs her because without her on the ship. He can't, can't go to a pull. lot of planets. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and also he needs her for other reasons. Emotionally. Emotion. <laughs> Emotionally. So then we see on the the com, we see Mal and Patience exchange some pleasantries. Um, basically, I love this because, you know, the transmission ends and it's that straight up thing of like, well, she's going to shoot me again, which is similar to spoilers for the movie. But we have the similar uh, instance in the movie where they speak to Inara and instantly they're like, oh, it's a trap. So it's funny how how well they all kind of read people, which is funny because they couldn't read the, the Alliance guy. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because it 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 really like highlights their desperation because they know that it's a trap and they know that he, she's gonna try to shoot him again, but they still have to go. They don't have a choice. You yes. know, like they're they're on their hands are tied behind their back. They have to make these desperate moves to just survive. So they decide to go, and meanwhile, um, Dobson is cutting through his bindings and breaking free. And then so the Serenity lands on Whitefall, the border planet. We see Mal and Zoe walk out to meet Patience and the henchmen. Mal sends Jane out beforehand to take the potential snipers out. And then Patience attempts to r- renege on the deal. But Jane, Mal, and Zoe uh, win. They dispatch the gang and take the money. And... Um, Jane was contact is contacted by Wash with the information that the Reavers that they thought had not followed them did in fact follow them. And I think that's yeah. that's interesting on its own. So Jane here is introduced essentially as the muscle. He's the one that can go up, beat up those couple of guys and be the sniper. You know, that's like his job. He's this big old dude. You then see him literally running down the hillside in fear to like tell them that the Reavers are coming. Yeah, exactly. And and the fact that Jane is afraid really makes us afraid. Because if he's afraid of it, like what chance do we stand? And that's playing with audience perceptions. The same thing was the case with like like with Buffy 
or with any uh, w- not just with Buffy but w- with so much with with so much entertainment if if you want to make the audience for example respect a character then you'll have other characters respect that character so like with Buffy all of the men in the show really respected Buffy in a sense and her strength and her leadership and that allowed the audience to respect a female leader and to admire a female leader so uh that kind of thing i feel like is a good technique and then book goes to go see the fed guy and the fed guy viciously attacks book knocking him out and then like doing it two more times why Why yeah it's really brutal like you said when you when he shoots kaylee you're instantly like wow man we hate this dude and then he does this and you're again he's like the innocent another innocent guy who was coming to like check on him and let him know that he's in trouble. And like say, he doesn't just knock him out. He then hits him another two times. It's like almost like he's this guy who knows he's powerless and he's taking any moment he can to try and assert his authority or whatever. Yeah, he's, he's, he's totally like an avatar of police brutality. Like there was no reason to hit two more times, but it's really like, it's really hateable so he gets a hold of a gun he points it at river and then mal arrives and without breaking a stride he shoots the fed guy that's the han solo moment yep um and then the reavers are on their are on uh, the reavers are on their tail and the reavers as a threat like really overshadows the fed guy and the alliance stuff Mm -hmm. so they just kind of throw the fed guy off the ship and, you know, the passengers are all uh, running around. He, Mal orders Anara to her shuttle. Um, Jane carries Kaylee to the engine room. Uh, Book goes along to help out. Um, and they basically, from the way I understand it, they try to pull a crazy Ivan maneuver where they're trying to envelop the Reaver ship in a fireball ignited by their exhaust, allowing them to escape. That's a pretty cool scene. Yeah, it's really cool to see how well they all work together, you know, and how great they are at what they do. So with Kaylee in the engine room and her relationship with Serenity and then Wash, obviously, as the pilot and his relationship with the ship. It's, yeah, like all these cogs that make it all work. And especially when we know the ship is like old and it's falling apart and half of its parts don't work, that they can... And it's just the survival thing and like the we, we do what we do because we have to. And I think because they've all come from like those kind of backgrounds, it, it, it pushes them to, to be the best. They uh, successfully escape and pop the champagne and everyone's kind of chilling out now. And then this is my favorite scene. So Book goes to Inara and confesses that he's lost and might be on the wrong ship and might have a concussion i just adding that in there so this is my favorite scene in this pilot because the imagery of it is so poetic like the shepherd is lost and he, he goes to inara for guidance and after inara says maybe you're exactly where you ought to be the camera pulls back and we see this iconic shot of Inara giving a benediction to the priest. It's like a man of God who kneels before the prostitute and is blessed by her hand. And it's all in a silhouette. And I think the the this the image really gets across the sanctity of woman. Uh, it's figuratively, I guess, it's the meeting with the goddess. It's quite it, it's quite an impressive, uh, very strong imagery, very poetic moment. Um, just kind of nestled in the foliage of this episode, very easily missed, but very, I don't know, it's very imp- imp- a very impressive scene, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, just jumping back to the, the Mal shooting uh, Dobson part, like for me, that's quite a pivotal thing because I feel like they're trying to get across uh, when Simon's holding the gun to him what is Simon willing to do to protect his sister? 
and it's right. like this big moment for Simon, but then Mal comes on and just takes that away from him. Do you know, I feel like that would have been the big moment where Simon realises what kind of world he's living in and what he might have to do in the future to keep his sister safe. And then Mal walks in and shoots him straight up without like a second thought because he's he's past that point. He know Mal's in a position where he knows what he has to do to keep his crew safe, you know, and he make has to make these quick decisions. And I think you see that in Book's face as well. Book gives the look of like, oh man, he killed him. But also he, you can see in his face he's kind of like, that kind of had to be done, I think. Yeah, Book is kind of doing the moral calculus and it's very confusing mm. for anyone who's ever tried to do calculus or <laughs> mathematics in general. Um, and you're right, that that's a really good point because Mal even mentions in conversation with Simon before he plays that trick on him that it should be you who is the one who has to deal with this Fed. But I, but I don't think you can. I don't think you have it in you. Mm. Uh, and that question is kind of left lingering because, as you said, Mal takes it away from him and shoots the guy. So yeah. Simon doesn't yet have to uh, confront that. Well, he confronts it, but he doesn't. He doesn't make the leap yet. But yeah. it's the first episode, so I imagine mm-hmm. if the show didn't get canceled, there would have been a lot of growth in that arena for Definitely. Simon, especially. So we see Simon and River finally reunite, um, and then in the passages quarters, Simon tucks River in and says they will find a safe place to live soon. The two share a much uh, well-relieved hug, properly reuniting at last after nearly three years apart. So I think it's really nice to see I don't know, she almost like looks at him as if to be like, like she doesn't, he's probably changed, you know, in these last three years. And it's like she's really assessing him as her brother because she hasn't seen him for so long and she's been through so much. So it's this really kind of nice, nice little moment. Um, And then on the bridge, Jane tells Mal that River's in danger and that Dobson has told him that the Alliance would keep after them. Mal asks if Dobson tried to bribe him and Jane lets him know that the bribe wasn't good enough but that if it'll but that it'll be interesting one day if it ever is. So yeah, it's like this like relationship where Mal's fully aware of the character of Jane and what kind of person he is. But he's useful to the crew and it, he knows that deep down he has a relationship with the crew, but also that if the money is ever good enough, he probably will betray him. So Jane leaves just as Simon enters and Mal suggests to Simon that he and River might be safer on the move than hiding in one place and points out that Serenity is always moving and needs a medic. So Simon accepts his offer to basically stay on board and become part of the crew. And thus we have our full crew of Serenity. And you have a little moment of honour tagged on at the end there, by the way, when Simon says, uh, how do I know you won't kill me in my sleep? And Mal's like, son, Mm. if I ever kill you, you'll be facing me, you'll be armed or something like that. But he's like, I'm not going to do it dishonorably. I'm I'm a man of honor in a den of thieves. That's really the psychological headspace. Yeah, if I ever shoot you, you'll be awake, you'll be facing me and you'll be armed it's like yeah he would never you know shoot someone in the back which is funny because we saw like the Dobson guy hit Shepard Book when he was unconscious so it just shows that like juxtaposition between the two very different kinds of men that we see so after that we see so I love the conversation with Zoe and Wash and Mal because he she's like um after the the amazing flying that he's done. She's like, she says, um, excuse me, I need this man to come and rip all of my clothes off. Again, like best TV couple ever, possibly, right? And he says still flying is just, is enough. So, you know, everything they go through, what the ship's falling apart, but as long as they're still managing to fly, that's like enough for them to keep going. Right, as long as, as long as they have, as long as he has freedom, Mm. That's enough. That's that's. I want to shoot shoot back to a bit. So we're going to talk about kind of like our favorite quotes and stuff. For me, I've kind of we missed the part. So the whole moment where um, Mal tells Simon that Kaylee's dead, 
So we have the moment where it's like, you're worried that Kaylee's dead. You have the whole, sl- it's so well done. The whole slow motion of him running. Everybody it cuts to looks sad, like cuts to Shepherd Book walking along looking really sad. So you think that it's real. And then he gets to the the infirmary and he's just like, the man's psychotic, Simon says. And then when it cuts to them all laughing, like you just see like what a crew they are. <laughs> And again, like the stuff they go through on a regular basis, this to them is hilarious. And um, Wash says, you are psychotic. So it's funny that, you know, they think the same thing, but to them it's hilarious. And to Simon, he's like, what the actual hell, you know? (laughs) Uh, So I think uh, those little quotes in there, so that when he says, yeah, the man's psychotic and it cuts to Wash and he's like, you're psychotic. That's definitely one of my favourite moments. Yeah, just a little playful ribbing, uh, uh, making it seem as, or or I guess um, uh, manipulating your feelings to make you think that you inadvertently caused the death of someone. (laughs) Just a little joke. (laughs) (sighs) I like the last one um, uh, that we just talked about. Um, I, I think... And I don't remember, I didn't write it down, but Simon says, or I, I think Mal says it's been a good day or something like that. And then Simon says, but, but like half the people have been shot and you've been hurt and all, all of this like catastrophe that's happened throughout the episode that we've seen. And then Mal responds, but we're still flying. That's the line, right? Yeah, that that right there for me is such a summation of everything that the show is about. Still flying... Um, and just like something to take into your own life, you know, everything, as long as, even if everything that can possibly go wrong goes wrong, as long as you're still flying and you can take that to mean whatever you want it to mean, it's, it's been a good day, you know? Mm. I like that line. (laughs) It's a good line. There's a lot of good quotes. Just um, I think Firefly is one of the kind of like most quotable shows um, just in kind of everyday life. Um, there's a lot of like obviously like really obvious ones like shiny or whatever that you, you can really take in uh, like out of the show and just use on a day-to-day basis. I don't know if that works. Do, have you tried? Does it work in the context of your life if you're not like a shoe polish? Can you use shiny? <laughs> I happen to make armor and it's great when it's shiny. No, I'm just, just, no, I I feel like at least when I was at college and I had like a good group of friends who all kind of enjoyed, or I had like especially one friend who really enjoyed Firefly. And you could say like, you just, it'd be be almost like an inside thing, you know, oh, shiny. And you you, you know what it is and everybody else is probably looking at you like, who even says that? Is that a thing? Is this a thing? Yeah, yeah. Right, so we'll move on now to a letter from a listener, our well-loved Berza Halverson. So um, they say, what are your thoughts about Nara's dropped poisonous syringe storyline? The quote from Tim kept me from watching Dollhouse for a long time. So I'll read that. So in, um, I don't think I was aware of this, by the way. Did you know about this, Chirag? Uh, Yeah, I did. I was aware of it. Um... I imagine it was something that I must have read over the course of the years, but Um, it has escaped my memory Um, so in a 2012 Science Channel special about Firefly series writer and executive producer Tim Minear explained um, Inara, she had this magic syringe she would take this drug and if she were for instance raped, the rapist would die a horrible death, the story was that she gets kidnapped by the Reavers and when Mal finally got to the ship to save her from the Reavers, he gets on the Reaver ship and all of the Reavers are dead which would suggest a kind of really bad assault, obviously, if they're all dead. Um, At the end of the episode, he comes in after she's been horribly brutalised and he comes in and gets down on his knee, takes her hand, and he treats her like a lady. And that's the kind of stuff that we wanted to do. It was very dark and this actually was the first story that Joss pitched to me when he asked me to come and work on the show. He said, these are the kind of stories we're going to do. However, at Another point, Inara was going to be slowly dying. Baccarin confirmed um, as much at a panel. So I imagine that is what we didn't ultimately intended the syringe to be revealed to be, although that plot was never resolved. So thank you for your letter. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, Chirag, about the about Inara possibly be having some yeah, real illness th- and dying. I think that was always the intention. 
to have mm. her have her illness be the reason she's on the ship. Right. It give, yeah. gave her a reason to leave where she was. So, like, I... So, as far as the first... The story point that Tim Minear was talking about, the potential episode. So, I understand that this is kind of a sensitive issue and a complaint that lots of people have about entertainment in general, which is depicting sexual assault against a woman or even implying it happened off screen is something that you can't you can't just do casually yeah like there has to be a really a very good reason you're doing it and if that reason is shock value or to service a male character's story arc i agree fuck that Mm -hmm. um but i i wanted to so here's where i might offer a counter argument as far as this and anyone listening can totally feel free to disagree with me here. I could be wrong. But uh, this is this is my opinion. So the scene as described by Tim Minear is basically saying that we're using the connection between the magic syringe and the ship full of dead reavers to imply that Inara has survived a brutal sexual assault, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so here's how I think that... that it could work. Uh, I th- well for number one, Inara is directly responsible for her own survival, and also for the deaths of all those reavers. She's not saved by Mal, so she makes a calculated decision that saves herself and results in a horrible Pyrrhic victory. And then for number two, I want to say uh, for number two, let me say that I think. I think Mal treating Inara like a lady in that context feels thematically meaningful for Inara's character arc because I think it subverts a shitty standard of sexual purity that women are expected to constantly live up to, especially in the society that we live in. And I think that's the beauty of Inara's character in general, that she's a prostitute and she's treated by society with respect and esteem and being a sex worker is honorable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also the central conflict between Inara and Mal because Mal has lost his honor. Like he used to be that respected sergeant. He used to believe in and fight for something that was important and it was an honorable fight. And now like in Inara's own words in another episode, he's just a petty thief so every time Mal insults Inara's profession, I think he's doing it from a place of male insecurity. I guess you could call that fragile masculinity. Um, and the show's written in a way to make it clear to us that Mal is wrong. But I don't, I don't think that's as important in the context of Berzer's question as this. What I really think is, is that Mal's attitude towards Inara is an echo of the attitude of our own society towards uh, sex workers. Like, we live in a society and culture that looks down on prostitutes, that considers them dirty, immoral, impure, uh, not worthy of protection and care and love. And not just prostitutes, but women in general have to deal with, like, purity standards. And uh, thinking about that, I was reminded in the story of uh, the Ramayana, uh, Ram's wife Sita gets kidnapped by the demon king uh, Ravan and when Ram goes and kills the demon king and rescues his wife and brings her back home to his kingdom the entire kingdom rejects her because she was kidnapped by another man and therefore she's now impure and doesn't have a place in royalty so that's that's just like a mythic example of something that's been happening for real since the dawn of humanity and I think having Mal get down on his knees, taking Inara's hand and treating her like a lady after she's just survived a brutal sexual assault can be such a powerful image because it's saying that survivors of sexual abuse are not diminished by what happened to them. They're not used up or impure. Uh, and coming from Mal after he spent the entire show insulting her honor and the honor of her profession, for him to treat Inara in that moment like her honor is intact, I think is important. 
because love, respect, and honor is for everybody, not just for Puritans or for Virgin Marys. They, everybody, everybody should be respected and honored and loved and protected regardless. And um, I think that, I, I mean, I know it depends on how it's written and how it's performed. And I guess the cultural context in which it airs on television. But I think it, it could work as a direction for the story. It would require that an, an apotheosis from Mal's perspective because he would need to change as a character as well as for Inara's thematic arc. But, I mean, that's that's just my thought on that. I mean, I think that Depends, was very... obviously. <laughs> very, very well said. Yeah, I mean, this obviously uh, calls to the part of this episode where the Reavers are coming and she's opening up the syringe. I mean, without knowing any of this, I obviously just think it's a syringe that would end her life because that's the better option than having anything brutally done to you by the Reavers. Mm-hmm. So well, well, the Reavers, the syri- the Reavers are all dead, which is evidence that the syringe was poisoned not for her, but for anyone who would uh, sexually assault her. I yeah, guess in this, the, yeah, the in this, yeah, in this. But yeah, without having known any of this kind of the thoughts that the creators had about it and where that syringe would come back up in oh, the future, okay. I get, I get, I would yeah, just, I get yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. <clears throat> as a as a viewer, you I, I would just assume that it was for her to to end her own life before being taken um, right. by the Reavers, like a cyanide um, capsule. Yeah, yeah, like that's as just from watching this episode, and it's a lot alone. That's kind of what I see it as, because yeah, why would why would you if you've got the choice? If they're boarding your ship and you've you've got no hope of fighting back against them, but um, thank you for your letter. Yeah, thanks, Berzer. Appreciate it. Um, so final thoughts on this is, well, for me, like a great pilot, a great intro to these characters in this world. Again, I was trying to wash it with fresh eyes, but it's really hard when you can probably quote the show from start to finish (laughs) from watching it so many times. But yeah, still as good as it ever was, I think. Yeah, I think like, uh, in my, uh, like, I guess high school years or something, I spent more time um, I spent more time with this show than I did with my family. That's how much I <laughs> h- how much I watched this show. Obviously that's an over exaggeration, but uh I I've seen it a lot and um seeing it again, it was it was good to see it with a more of a critical eye. Usually I just see it for the jokes and for the moments, but I think I I came to some insights that I hadn't thought of before just because of this podcast. So that was in a sense, fresh eyes. Um, thank you for the, thank you for the reason to watch it in from a different angle. Yeah, definitely. Cause yeah, I think the same, I was kind of, you know, in my late teens when I watched this and I watched it a lot, I had friends who really loved it. So we would watch it a lot. Like I said, being to conventions, I have a lot of merchandise. I read the books but it's kind of like then it was a show that you'd I'd put it on all the time and like you said earlier you put it on in the background or you know it's just can always be there but to watch it to really purposefully kind of delve into it further to discuss um it's yes yeah, like a new thing and i think with shows like this you always notice little new things yeah i'm intrigued to watch um the rest of it with these eyes me too <laughs> um the next episode is the train job so so this the train job was the one that originally aired for people was the first episode that's so the I'll first be, pilot i'll be interested i will try and watch this because i never had that experience i've only ever watched my dvd set um which is in the correct order i will try and watch this as if it's the first thing because i i'm kind of interested into how this would be as your intro to the show Okay, so uh, thank you, Trirog. Thank you, listeners. If anyone wants to send in letters, please do. You can send them to fireflybits at gmail.com. We'd love to hear what you have to say, any more talking points for us. So that's fireflybits for back in the skies at gmail.com. 
Uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to look at my cosplays uh, from Firefly, I will post uh, uh, something on my Instagram. I'll probably do another post maybe with just the props that I've made. I already post posted my kind of little Firefly collection that I have. Um, so you can find me at uh, LauraJP1721 on Instagram. And then we'll be back next time to talk about train job. Uh, so a slight synopsis for you. Mal has second thoughts after discovering that two boxes of Alliance goods that his crew has been hired to steal are full of badly needed medical supplies headed for the mining town of Paradiso. So it's a good one to discuss because, again, it's about like the whole kind of moral dilemmas that this crew faces all the time. All right. But uh, until then, uh, stay shiny. shiny. good day. You had the alliance on you. Criminals and savages. Half the people on the ship have been shot or wounded, including yourself, and you're harboring known fugitives. Well, they're still flying. That's not much. It's enough. This episode of the Nevers Podcast was written, researched, produced, and edited by Matthew at Culture Inject Studios. The intro and outro music was produced by Gilirme Morais. We are more than just a podcast. We're a fan community. You can keep up to date on The Nevers and chat with other fans by visiting hbothenevers.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search HBO The Nevers, all one word, and click that follow button. The Nevers Podcast is not endorsed by Mutant Enemy, Warner Media Entertainment, or any of its subsidiaries, including Home Box Office, HBO, and is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. The Nevers and all names, pictures, and audio clips are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respective copyright holders. 